big hello and a very warm welcome to Leaders of Tomorrow Season 8 with me, Sonali Krishna. Today as well, we're uh, doing something different. We're focusing on a sector that has truly benefited and will come of age thanks to the lockdown and thanks to COVID-19. I'm talking about none other than telemedicines. Now, the telemedicine startup ecosystem in India has received a major stimulant because of COVID-19. Virtual consultations, which is really, you know, getting a doctor's checkup via audio, uh, visual, or even telephonic uh, recommendations or prescriptions are now becoming slowly but steadily the norm. Today I'm joined by three very successful founders who have uh, charted their journey in this ecosystem, the telemedicine ecosystem. And then they're joining me right here on the Leaders of Tomorrow to discuss the potential the sector has, uh, how you know India at large has taken to the sector given the pandemic we're currently facing and the fact that we've been uh, in lockdown mode for now four and a half months and counting. So without further ado, let me introduce to you my very illustrious panel. I have Vikas Johan, co-founder of 1MG Technologies. Satish Kannan, co-founder of Medibuddy Docs App. And Rajat Garg, co-founder and CEO, My Upchar. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me right here on the show. And I'm looking forward to having a very illuminating conversation. Uh, let me start with you, Vikas. Uh, could you give me a sense of the overall uh, picture of the telemedicine ecosystem pre-COVID? before we got into the lockdown mode and before this pandemic hit us, what was the kind of traction the telemedicine uh, sector was really getting? Due to COVID, uh, the, the segment has, uh, you know, preponed a bit. Whatever could have happened or whatever traction we could have achieved in the, in, in the coming years, it has been preponed by, by a couple of years. Uh, adding to that, there has been a significant um, uh, uh, support from the infrastructure. When I talk about infrastructure, it is uh, uh, smartphone penetration, which has happened and low low cost data charges. So all these have enabled consumer to access technology solutions to do the teleconsultations or, or, or take doctor advice through this medium. So that, that has been fundamentally what has, uh, you know, leapfrogged uh, in the last three, four months. If you talk about our platform, uh, the, uh, the queries on fever, flu, or related uh, categories have jumped over 440% uh, uh, in the initial COVID uh, days. And then, then that significantly talks about how technology can help consumers uh, if uh, enabled in the right fashion. Sure. Let me come to you, Satish. From my limited understanding, one would have thought that, you know, broadly the doctor-patient relationship is such an intimate one that requirement to go to the doctor the touch and feel of the doctor is so important in our own mindsets in our own psyche to get some assurance that the doctor has checked me and now is giving me a prescription how far do you think uh, we've been able to shatter that mindset where we as as indians are okay to accept medication or a prescription via a you know a virtual medium in india because we are a very very large country and we have a lot of shortage of doctors most of the specialist doctors are in the big cities so primarily what happens is there is an access issue a lot of people stay in very, very small towns, uh, good doctors, top hospitals, all of them are in the big cities. So there is a natural challenge that is there because of the geographical distance between them. right? So even in those cases, it is ideal. We all would like it if they can really go meet every doctor in person. But uh, because of the size of the country and because of shortage of doctors, it is a challenge by the very nature of it. So accessibility continues to be a challenge. And this was true uh, yesterday in the sense before COVID also. Now, what has COVID created? COVID has generally uh, created a challenge in a physical visit. So it is not advisory. It is also not safe if you want to like really go to a hospital uh, or a clinic. Uh, unless it is very, very important and a very, very emergency for you to do, right? So one is access and another is uh, in a way COVID, right? Both of this has in a way made it compulsory and it's a necessity in a way to actually talk to a doctor online, right? Now, 
both these one is pre covid one is post covid but what has covid fundamentally changed covid has created what we call as a huge behavioral change in the thinking of the people right so what has happened because of covid is one customers or patients have been forced to create a behavior change two doctors and hospitals initially a lot of doctors were not on the technology platforms we are not using all of these solutions but that has also grown significantly now because doctors are also not able to do their opds and the third is the regulation also has become super uh, supportive now uh, we I, I, i think all of us on the panel have been working on telemedicine guidelines for around 5 to 6 years now uh, but what has interestingly happened is because of the challenges on covid and on lockdown the regulation got improved in a very short period of time so behavior change society change uh, regulation change so all of this is accelerating and new changes and new methodologies are coming in place so that is the reason why uh, in a way it is positive and in a way it will help a lot of people from very very small town rajat let me come to you now and i want to throw some light on you know the regulatory framework for telemedicine that uh, the indian government launched on the first day of the lockdown you know could you throw some light and make my audience as well as me understand what these guidelines are and what it means for the sector specifically sure definitely so um, you know earlier um, there were um, the regulation on this was not very clear and uh, we had associations that were warning doctors that there may be criminal cases against them if they um, you know if they basically do online consultation and they were citing some uh, some cases in courts which were not very relevant but nobody really bothered to check uh, so with this guideline basically it clearly states that you can do teleconsultation um, in what conditions you can do consultation in what condition you should not do a consultation how do you maintain um, you know digital records for every consultation you do so you don't you should not be doing it over whatsapp you should be using some software that allows you to track and maintain a record of every consultation you do plus how do you write how do you provide a prescription um, there used to be a requirement of having uh, you know self certified uh, certificates uh beforehand signature certificates beforehand but now it can be a just simpler digital signature so they came up with a number of guidelines that simplified a lot of things like they talked about like first time you're talking to a new patient you need to have a video consult you should have a video consult second time on where you don't need a video consult you can just do it over phone so uh bunch of things they have clarified that has put a lot of things on rest uh, at rest uh, there are still some open areas which i think will uh, with time the things will clear, get clarified there are some medical legal issues that uh, some associations have pointed out that uh, uh, current the current insurance uh, system does not cover these specific changes but i think those uh insurance policies will automatically update over the year um to include start including these changes which are around life medical liability etc etc um so a fairly uh, positive movement for the industry because uh, suddenly from you know uh, uh, a, a situation where uh, both doctors and patients were a bit wary of participating on these platforms um now we have moved to a situation where both doctors are excited as well as interested because they also want to have uh, you know uh, earn money uh, by doing consultations online um and patients of course they are also want to see their doctors without actually physically visiting them so very very uh, well timed um, um you know regulation that has opened up the industry and really moved us forward by like 10 years right you know vikas give me a sense as to you know lots of startups in uh, the telemedicine space and what was the kind of outlook for telemedicine pre covid were startups still in the investment phase because you know this entire concept of telemedicine is is still new and novel or you know was it that startups such as yours and the others on the panel had already started making money 
there are different models which are operating in this segment. Um, I think um, with certain threshold uh, being reached, each of these startups, each of these uh, businesses will uh, will have their own uh, roadmap for product profitability but the, the underlying principle is same there is an unmet need uh, which is there there is a, a gap in terms of uh, a, a lot many consumers looking for services and not having access to right doctors uh, that that fundamental problem is being solved uh, by the, these startups another area which becomes slightly niche in this and that that has a day one profitability or or element assigned to it is second opinion services which is again forms a part of uh, teleconsultation but has an element where you need a specialist access and uh, and and charge a premium so also depends on nature of consultation uh, 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 for example tabooed categories like uh, sexual wellness or something like that has a very uh, ingrained element where an online consultation becomes uh, the primary area for it. So uh, I think um, these are some of the areas. There are some of the niche teleconsultation platforms also, like uh, psychiatric counseling, where mental health has come to the forefront. And in COVID times, uh, I think this has, in the later stage, has come one of the strong elements. And there are dedicated portals only for these kind of specialties. So there is a different life cycle also which goes uh, with this. So a, a lot of factors when it comes to um, the startups and, and players trying to solve this problem. Some are addressing uh, some niche areas and some are addressing to the other extreme, the complete integrated approach. So these are the variety of startups and uh, each one has a different use case. You know, if you could throw light on, you know, where is this uh, latent demand coming for, uh, you know, telemedicine? Is the traction coming more from urban areas or is it as expected that because the access in, let's say, remote towns and rural areas is a lot lesser, the traction is uh, hence coming from there? Now what is happening is, I'll tell you again, okay, maybe we do a comparison, right? So earlier, let's say pre-COVID, a lot of let's say on medibuddy docs app a lot of our customers actually used to come from the smaller town so it used to be in the range of 65 right 60 to 65 coming from smaller towns and around 35 to 40 coming from the big cities now now what has happened is it has become sort of like 50 50 because uh, the access to a doctor has been a challenge in the big cities also like you all understand right now the key point that we have to note here is all novel businesses or new businesses or innovative businesses when they start it is actually started with a certain smaller section but what covid has done is it has created awareness about this solution to anybody and everybody a loose example to compare will be demonetization right in demonetization you could not use a physical cash so you had to understand that there is a bank methodology you can use the bank and transfer and many companies during that window actually grew very fast and after that it has been continuing to grow very well a very similar analogy is what we can do in this scenario also earlier people in the cities could go but now that has not been possible so then a lot of online players are there There's, so they were all growing but now this has given them a, like a huge boost to like really push them in the forefront create huge awareness and so that is why you start now seeing that it is it is more in the 50 50 range and uh, this will continue to keep uh, uh, growing, let's say, going forward. Sure. Rajat, you know, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. I believe the World Health Organization recommends that the doctor to patient ratio, which is a healthy ratio, is 1 is 2,000. Could you give me a sense as to what is that ratio in India? I mean, I don't know, is it 1 to 2,000 or is it is it worse than that? And secondly, you know, what is the kind of shortage uh, that India at large has in terms of doctors and nurses? Some of the research that I've done shows that there are uh, an estimated 600,000 doctors and 2 million nurses 
uh, in terms of shortfall that India is currently facing. Would that be accurate? Overall, WHO recommends one is two thousand uh, doctor to patient ratio compared to one is to and India overall has a one is to thirteen hundred doctor to patient ratio, but it's fairly skewed because seventy eight percent of the doctors only serve twenty two percent of the population of India. So when you go to tier two, tier three, the doctor to patient ratio is actually one is to forty three hundred. Um, then if you look at the rural belt, uh, there are some estimates out there that there are only 32,000 doctors serving roughly, you know, 40-50% of the population. Um, so situation, you know, uh, in India is fairly uh, grim as you go down um, from tier 1 to tier 2 to tier 3 to rural. Um, also, that's why, you know, in COVID, it's a, a huge issue as uh, COVID spreads to the hinterland because there's just not enough health capacity, health infrastructure out there to serve these users. Um, as, uh, you know, the other panelists also talked about, uh, we, uh, and on our platform, we see roughly 80-85% of traffic coming from tier 2 and tier 3 and a marginal number coming from tier one uh, side and rural belt. And rural is small because the uh, smartphone adoption is still low. Um, as time progresses, those people will come online and also start accessing these features. Sure, because, you know, given that now we have a regulatory framework for telemedicine, would it be that this sector would now attract a lot more investors and uh, this business will now have some clarity in terms of the business model that it will take and, and, and shape into? Building a proposition which can fundamentally solve a problem that a user is facing, if you can scale that, um, one, it will give you a roadmap for profitability for yourself and build a business that is sustainable. And obviously in, the ro in, that, in that path, you will have opportunities where investments uh, uh, is, is something that you may explore. Definitely, uh, given the low cost of customer acquisition or the marketing market becoming more conducive and a lot more consumers coming to this segment will attract investment. Uh, you will see a lot more startups coming into it. Uh, a lot more uh, traditional uh, players might also pour into it, and that's what we have seen in the last three four months. Um, uh, yes, uh, it will be it will be good to see uh, uh, one uh, from. Uh, the activity or the innovation that will happen into it. Two, fundamentally, uh, people are driving to solve the problem. And three, uh, both these elements, when when they happen, they attract investment. Investment can be in form of uh, the, the the external capital that we want to look at. Investment can also be in terms of more talent or people coming in to solve the problem. So both the areas I see will see significant jump in this. Satish, what would you think would be the key challenges going forward, not only in the COVID era, but also in the post-COVID era? How do you see this space pan out? And more importantly, you know, given that this is such an intimate space and it tackles something so personal, what would be the parameters of success here? I mean, credibility would be a very, very important requirement for each of you. And the fact that, you know, the people, the doctors that you employ, you know, all of those checks and all of that would be, you know, extremely important. And I'm not sure what is checks and balances required uh, for such a large ecosystem to ensure that this is a robust mechanism. We are now put in a lot of processes. Might be a lot of this is not disclosed or talked about outside, but every doctor who is onboarded on our platform has got around three checks. Right. Every doctor's all educational qualifications are verified and there's a lot of uh, MCA related data that's database available. So you can verify using that to an in-house doctor. Think like a HOD or a head of department also talks to the doctor to actually do like an interview to understand what are the strengths of the incoming doctor and ensure that you're able to give the right advice by the HOD of the department of let's say pediatrics to the doctor who's joining. So that's the second way of, to ensure that quality as well as the right guidance is provided to the incoming doctor. He'll have a lot of experience, but the HOD will support uh, that incoming doctor. So that's the 
set of uh, rules as well as guidelines that we have in the onboarding. And the last point that you asked me about was, what is the future, right? See, what is going to happen in the future is it's going to be a combination of online and offline. Might be the words are called digital, right? Physical plus digital. So these are all different words that many people use, but it's going to be a mix because you can't do everything online, but it's not necessary that everything has to happen offline, right? So there's going to be a healthy mix going forward. If you ask me, if you if you ask me to bet, I would bet that digital will do around 60 to 70 percentage of the work going forward because now that we have started doing this, we understand the power of it. 60 to 70 percentage, like your medicine delivery, you can do it easily. The lab would come to your house and pick up the sample. But if you have to do an X-ray or to ultrasound, you go there, right? And even in the doctor, you can do the first round of consultation, second round of consultation through the online. Then you go offline. So that's going to be the uh, sort of a hybrid approach that's going to come out in the coming coming months and coming coming years and that's the mix that I, I i i believe will happen in the coming coming decades for that matter in the healthcare space sure rajat how do you compare i know we're still in our nascent stages but just to get a sense how does the telemedicine sector in india and if you juxtapose that, that with the rest of the world and other countries where are we in that pecking order second question is how much cheaper will uh, virtual doctors be compared to actually going in and visiting a doctor in person? So it really depends. I think uh, you know, when you compare it to more developed markets compared and compare it to um, you know, third world, other developing economies, uh, especially in Southeast Asia and Africa, the cost is very, very different for a consultation. And it also depends on who is paying that. So uh, a lot of cases, the insurance companies, especially in the developed countries, are paying or co-going paying that consultation cost. So consumer directly doesn't pay the consultation cost. Um, in India and in many other countries, a consumer directly pays uh, the doctor consultation cost. So there are advantages in some other models, like uh, chat consultation models. Uh, there are advantages in some other things that digital companies can do. So, for example, we have uh, been investing in an AI algorithm to um, ask different questions and basically predict the diagnosis that is then given to doctor for um, uh, for basically evaluating. Um, and the doctor can agree with it or disagree with it. If it disagrees, then the feedback again goes into the AI. And the idea is basically to reduce the time that is spent by the doctor on the on the on every uh, consultation while increasing the accuracy level. On our platform, uh, you know, uh, given the type of traffic we attract, um, typically tier three rural dens, what we are seeing is that the behavior even in offline world is not to pay for consultation. Because these people pay, uh, these people go to quacks, and typically quacks charge for medicines and not for consults. And the same behavior they're trying to replicate online. So we give it for free. So who pays as as my charge? We are paying uh, for training of the users and education of the users to develop uh, uh, develop trust on the online system. Interesting space to be in. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time. I am definitely a lot more in enlightened about the telemedicine space uh, compared to I was, let's say, 30 minutes ago. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, slowly and steadily, this sector will uh, gain uh, more legs and uh, will be able to first walk and then fly. All the very best and thank you once again. Stay happy, stay safe and uh, stay healthy, more importantly.